this uh, symposium focused on intravascular lithotripsy. Before deep diving into real-world data on IVL and some great cases selected by our distinguished faculty, let me give you a short introduction on the technology. Starting from the clinical need, namely the impact of coronary artery calcification on PCI. The presence of heavily calcified stenosis increases the risk of vascular complications, impedes stent deliverability, and prevents its full expansion. This negative impact of calcium on PCI success has direct consequences on the uh, clinical outcomes. The presence of severe calcification, in fact, increases by itself the mortality rate and the rate of combined ischemic endpoints. Currently available devices still leave some unmet clinical needs. If we consider balloon-based therapies, we know that high-pressure balloons preferentially uh, expand away from calcium, having a limited effect on eccentric calcifications. High-pressure inflations are predisposed to major dissection and perforation, often at interface between calcium and healthy tissues. These issues are largely overcome by atherectomy devices that yet bear some shortcomings in vessels with large lumens and deep calcium location. In bifurcations where the operator might feel the need to protect the side branch and in tortos calcified arteries where the risk of complication might increase. These potential issues are overcome by intravascular lithotripsy. How does it work? Within the shockwave balloon, miniaturized emitters are able to generate vapor bubbles that create short bursts of sonic pressure waves that travel through the vessel with an effective pressure of about 50 atmospheres. This enables localized field effect within the vessel, fracturing both intima and media calcification. Among the several advantages of intravascular lithotripsy, uh, we can uh, list the absence of requirement for a specialized wire, shock waves pass through the plug and the vessel wall, enabling modification of deep calcium. Disrupted calcium remains in the vessel wall, thereby reducing the risk of distal embolization. Lithotripsy allows calcium modification to be performed at the low balloon pressure thereby avoiding the risk associated with high pressure inflations. And finally, with IVL, we're able to protect side branches with a second uh, guide wire. I'd like to conclude this short introduction by giving you a quick glance on our session that is split in two parts. In the first part of the session, we will share the experience of excellent operators with three challenging cases selected by Drs. Ribichini, Howder, and Al Noriani. At the end, we will have a live discussion with the operators who will be very happy to address your questions. Thereafter, we will hear from Drs. Yelasi and McIntyre-Gert the results of real-world registries on the impact of IVL on clinical outcomes and on cost-effectiveness, followed again by live interactive discussion. So sit back and enjoy this exciting session. Hello. This is a case of combined use of intravascular lithotripsy in the iliac artist to prepare the access for a valve implantation and the treatment of a calcified coronary artery. It's about a young male with multiple comorbidities and risk factors with a known valvular heart disease, severe aortic stenosis, and a follow-up with preserved LV function, advanced CKD, a sad history of previous encephalitis and previous two major stroke, one ischemic and one hemorrhagic, symptomatic for known peripheral arterial disease causing bilateral claudication. The patient came to our observation and was actually admitted at the intensive care unit because of an acute decompensation and acute pulmonary edema, as you can appreciate at the X-ray, and initial movements of troponin. He needed non-invasive ventilation and massive doses of diuretics, but in the following hours, it was clear that the compensation was due to additional anterior myocardial wall ischemia, 
to his history of severe aortic stenosis. So he was sent for emergency coronary angiogram and balloon counterpulsation. But as you can see in the angiography, we found this uh, expected peripheral vascular disease with subocclusive stenosis on the two common iliac arteries. So we reverted to a radial access and uh, we found this severe coronary artery disease at the level of the anterior uh, descendant artery, proximal stenosis, very calcified. Due to the complexity and the young age of the patient, he was sent to the CCU for a car team discussion. The surgeon, of course, agreed with the combined surgery on the valve and the artery, but due to the previous cerebral damages the patient had himself, anyway, able to decide, and his family categorically refused the surgery and preferred an option for TAVI plus PCR. This is the CT scan showing the compatibility of the annulus for both an Edwards valve 26 or a core valve 29. And this is the CT scan of the peripheral uh, circulation. You can see on the right is confirmed a subocclusive lesion of the common iliac, and on the left, a very calcified stenosis on the left common iliac. So the strategy was planning to use IVL to prepare the way from the transfemoral axis instead of using a transapical, doing the procedure with a balloon expandable because of the nice introducer it has, the 14 French, which would be helpful to perform the PTA. I was guidance on the coronary to decide whether IVL might be necessary also on the coronaries, everything performed in local anesthesia and by percutaneous approach. So we start with a nice demonstration of the composition of the plaque on the iliac. On the right, as you can see, as suggested by, by CT, there is no calcium. It's a soft plaque. And then after the crossover from the, the right to the left, we analyzed the left uh, stenosis, which is instead strongly calcified and very tight. It's a superclusive stenosis with a lot of calcium in the transition between the common and the external left iliac artery. So what we did was starting with IBL with the balloon 660. And after two cycles, you see that the ischid of the valve cannot cross the stenosis at the spot of the calcium. So we added more treatment with other four cycles of energy. And after that, you can appreciate this nice introducer going easily to the aorta. On the right side, we used normal PTA because it was, as you can see, the balloon uh, easily expanded. And we use this uh, artery as the uh, diagnostic way to implant the valve. The valve was implanted on the left iliac artery and uh, given the uh, advanced CKD of the patient, we did not make a final check, but the valve implantation was okay. Well, after that, we engaged easily with an extra backup catheter, the left coronary uh, system, and perform an accurate analysis of the LED disease, which as you can see, shows a spot calcification on the left main, some calcium at the osseal LED, but then we got deep into the stenosis and we can see 180 degrees of circumferential calcium up to 270 degrees at the point of the tightest part of the lesion and 90 degrees calcification in the mid part of the LED. So this is severe calcification, which is confirmed after this pre-test, I would say, of uh, balloon inflation. This is a non-compliant 320 millimeters balloon at high atmospheres, and you can observe that there is still some residual stenosis. So with no further doubt, we applied IVL using the shockwave C2 3.5 12 millimeters balloon in this proximal LED lesion at the points of this maximum calcification. And on the right side of the slide, you can appreciate very nice images of the site of plaque rupture after the application of the IVL treatment with the shockwave balloon. So the rest is, uh, uh, you can see here, the nice inflation of the shockwave balloon. The rest is uh, conventional angioplasty. This is the navigation of uh, 326 onyx 10 
in the mid uh, uh, LED. And you can see how underexpanded it looks in the IVUS imaging after stent implantation, despite the use of uh, high pressures. And so what we did was uh, uh, finalizing the treatment with an additional stent on the proximal part because of a residual plaque and a post dilatation at high pressure with a 4-0 non-compliant balloon at high atmospheres. So uh, this is the coronary treatment with the final angiographic result, a very nice angiographic image of the proximal and mid LED, which is confirmed with the IVOS observation, especially at the point of the maximum calcification where you see an acceptable expansion of the intravascular endoprothesis. Before closing the percutaneous access, we did this final check. We see the stenosis on the right where we had a soft plaque. And so we decided to implant a self-expandable stent at the level of the uh, right uh, common iliac artery. While on the left, you can appreciate that there is a dissection, but a very nice large lumen with a very good flow and no images of flow obstruction. So we left this uh, left uh, iliac artery alone without stenting. We have a follow-up of six months of this patient and he is doing very well. I think that the key takes away of this case is that IVL is effective in both concentric and uneven asymmetric calcified plaques. It works in the peripheral circulation as well as in the coronary circulation, of course, using dedicated material, and it safely dilates large vessels with lower risk of perforation and dissection, gaining a much larger lumen compared to balloons, according to the results of this wrapped paid 3 randomized control trial. Thank you very much. So it's my, my pleasure to share with you a case of a patient, a high-risk patient with left main disease in whom we used IVL. These are my potential conflicts of interest. So this is a story of an 83-year-old male patient who presented with class 3 angina according to the Canadian Cardiovascular Society and dyspnea in class 3 according to the New York Heart Association. In 2008, he received the drug eluting stents in the mid-LAD and in the diagonal branch. Currently, he is under stable conditions and um, he, he is troponin negative. He has a depressed uh, left ventricular ejection fraction of 34%. Comorbidities include a severe chronic obstructive lung disease. Renal function is fairly good, but he on top of that has an occluded right internal carotid artery. His medication included aspirin, an ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker, and the diuretic and a statin. So this is the coronary angiogram that was performed in that patient showing a distal left main bifurcation stenosis. You can appreciate the formerly implanted stents in the LAD and in the, the uh, diagonal branch. On top of that, the patient has an occluded right coronary artery, five millimeter distal to the ostium with this morphology. Now, we went into the heart team. We calculated the syntax score one with 31 and the syntax score 2020 with a 10 year mortality for cabbage of 84.9% and a 10 year mortality for PCI of 87.9%. The five year MACE rates for cabbage and for and for um, PCI are a little bit more in favor of cabbage, 5% less, but nevertheless, they are severely high. So in, after discussion with our surgical friends, we came to the conclusion because of the age and the comorbidities of the patient with the occluded internal carotid artery and severe obstructive, chronic obstructive lung disease, we prefer to offer the patient a protected PCI under support with a left main LAD, left circumflex DK crush, PCI after lesion preparation with IVL. Now, 
For the planning of the procedure, first thing we did a peripheral angiography to decide from where we go with the impeller. Both axes from left and right groin are fairly good to do so. So we intended to go from the left side and uh, use the right side for the uh, intervention at uh, the coronary level. Uh, radial arteries, unfortunately, both in these patients, this patient were occluded. You see the impeller in place here. You see the angiography. Uh, we used a 7 French uh, XP 3.5 guiding catheter. And then we made an IVUS for the planning of the procedure to decide about the vessel size in LAD circumflex artery and left main and to decide how much calcium is there. And you can see that there are several spots of significant superficial as well as deep calcification along the route that we have to address with our PCI procedure. And therefore, we move forward and uh, in intended to do an IVL lesion preparation first. We used a 3.5 by 12 millimeter balloon and we took half of the uh, pulses, four runs at 10 pulses for the LAD with an average occlusion time of 17 seconds while the impeller was working. And we did the same with four runs with uh, 10 pulses with an average occlusion time of 17 seconds each for the circumflex artery. And after we have done this lesion preparation, we, we continued with the procedure. And you can see here the result after the lesion preparation with the IVL. And then we continued with our DK crush procedure. We first sent a 4 by 15 millimeter desk to the circumflex artery. This was crushed with a uh, 4 balloon, NC balloon. Then we did the first kissing two 4 balloons in the circumflex and LAD into the left main, followed by a positioning of the uh, stand, the desk in the in the um, left main to LAD. You can see we used a 4 here according to the distal size of the LAD. And then that was implanted on the left side and pot was performed with a 5.5 millimeter balloon in order to achieve apposition of the struts in the left main. Then we did the second crush procedure after rewiring again twice 4 balloons in the LAD and circumflex artery and then we have the final pot procedure being done with the 5.5 millimeter balloon in the in the left main again. This is the final angiographic result that has been achieved in that patient. I think fairly good opening of that distal stenosis in the left main and if we look in the IVA evaluation at the end you can see a well apposition of the struts in the LAD the circumflex artery and the left main and you can see that we have achieved nice round lumen all the calcium was pushed outside with uh, facilitation of the IVL lesion preparation so then at the end we need to withdraw our impeller and we close the access side of the 14 French uh, sheet in the left groin with a Manta closure device and you can see that uh, we nicely were able to close it so this was the case uh, showing that you can use um, IVL in the significant left main disease uh, with the support, hemodynamic support of an impeller uh, for making the whole procedure much, much safer and achieving a very good lesion preparation before start working there with stents. And thereby, I would like to thank you very much for your kind attention. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to EuroPCR 2021 in this exceptional environment. We will be presenting about management of eccentric calcific lesion using shockwave. Uh, I'm Dr. Arif Nuriani from Mohaf, Ministry of Health and Prevention, United Arab Emirates, Al Qasmi Hospital. I have no conflict of interest. We'll be talking about a patient who is 79 years old male, uh, hypertensive for over than 20 years, referred to us 
for the management of severe aortic stenosis, and tether workup revealed severe stenosis in the proximal LAD bifurcation lesion involving a large Z1. After long discussion, the heart team uh, and due to the patient preference, the decision was to go for PCI then TAB and then TAB. So in the first image on the left side, we can clearly see a true bifurcation, uh, Medina class 111, involving moderately sized diagonal, which has diffused disease involving the ostium with some kind of calcification. And the LED showing two lesions. One is distant to the bifurcation, the second is proximal, probably involving the diagonal, which would be showing very soon that the, the true calcification is more in a, on a different or in a different segment. On the right side is from another projection. Then here we have decided to go with an imaging and understand the characteristics of these lesions before uh, proceeding further. But strategically, we have decided to go for two stent strategy because this diagonal is an important vessel and we don't want by any means to lose this branch. And the uh, IVUS that being conducted showing from the distal already diffusely kind of disease, showing kind of soft blood fibrotic a bit distally. The more we come proximal, we see more kind of fibrocalcific and tight lesion, as we have seen here and demonstrated before in the angiography uh, lesion. And then coming close to the bifurcation, which shows uh, the second wire coming in and proximally, there's another eccentric lesion, but not much, but more proximal, we can see really more eccentric uh, calcified lesion, almost 270 degree, and which we thought uh, shockwave or any kind of lesion modification would be of great help to optimize our outcome. This is another still image. Then we have decided here to go with a 2-5 cutting balloon to prepare the diagonal first, as we thought uh, that is also needed since we have decided to go for a DK crush technique and not to have any chance of missing or having challenges of recrossing the diagonal, followed by a placement of the 2523 BES. Then this was crushed, uh, the osteo, using a 3-5 NC balloon with a good result at the diagonal site. Later, we went to predilate the distal LAD. We thought it could be, I mean, we could have saved ourselves using another shockwave due to cost effectiveness sometimes also, but uh, we, we saw that this was some kind of waste there and uh, after Sometime we decided to go better with a shockwave. And here we have used a three shockwave balloon, which is uh, uh, 13 length as available in the market. And the three five shockwave balloon for the proximal, more proximal part. And then as we routinely also using a post dilating to optimize the pre-dilatation and preparation of the lesion using an NC balloon that was with a 3 NC distally and a 3-5 proximally. Finally, we decided to go with one stent, the 3-5-30 DS, which covered both lesions. And here we can appreciate the placement of the stent. And in the second on the right, we can see the inflation and expansion of the stent without any residual waste, which means that we have done a very good successfully 
uh, preparation of the lesion. That the rest is the routine with a DK crush, uh, second DK crush balloon, two five with a three, and then final pot to optimize the proximal part that we do routinely as well. Here we can see a still image of the diagonal proximally in the stent segment. And the uh, right side, on the right side, we see the LED and the stent beautifully expanded and will oppose to the wall. Final angiogram showing the fantastic result at the bifurcation, which we believe that wouldn't have been achieved without using uh, our magic touch of shockwave in this case. So, tips in the management of eccentric calcified lesions, the changes that we would like to suggest that in, um, more number of shocks are required to modify the eccentric lesion uh, than the concentric one. And uh, also in the long lesions, uh, certainly. Number of shocks in eccentric segments should be at least 20 to 30 shocks. In this situation, we have given four shocks distally and four shocks series proximally, so total of eight uh, waves, each of 10 pulses, which might be due to wave reflection as in concentric lesions. Proper and C balloon dilatation should be done, assuring proper expansion uh, before implanting the scent. That is not all the time, as I said, in some cases is advisable, but we use more or less directly the balloon practice. Shockwave technology is effective in treating eccentric calcific lesion. Identification of eccentricity should be done mainly by intravascular imaging rather than angiography. We have shown and demonstrated very well in this case that proximal at the bifurcation was not showing uh, much rather than the left uh, with the imaging the child proximally the lesion. Then shockwave is to be considered in bifurcation lesion with severe calcification, which has a great impact for preserving both branches and optimize the outcome on long term. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the three speakers who selected for us excellent cases. I invite uh, Arif, uh, Michael, and Flavio to open their microphone and join us the discussion with, with the discussion. I have to thank Olga Neff, our chat master, who's doing a great job in the chat, uh, encouraging questions and trying to address comments of the colleagues. And we have got many, really. Uh, people is really excited about uh, these cases. So let me start with Arif. Arif, you showed us a nice um, demonstration of uh, intravascular lithotripsy, uh, equally effective to treat not just concentric lesions, but also eccentric lesions. So the first question to you from one of our co colleagues is whether this technology works also in calcified nodules. Well, certainly. Thank you very much, first of all, for hosting me at this meeting. And uh, certainly we have demonstrated that the efficacy of shockwave is as good in the eccentric lesion as good as in the concentric lesion. And uh, having nodules around shouldn't be limiting our usage of IVL. We could use it a very efficient way as well. So, and that will really, as we demonstrate again, how we could really protect our side branches also and reduce the carina shift and the kind of impact of uh, reducing the well expansion of the stents at the two uh, vessels. Thank you. Okay. Short question and short answer to you again, Arif. Um, one colleague was interested in the combination with um, uh, cutting balloon. Is IVL safer than cutting balloon or are two different things? Can you comment on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, cost-wise, it's one of the factors that we are trying to save ourselves. We know that there are many sizes and we couldn't use more than two in this case. So cutting balloon would be a bailout or kind of supportive tool uh, instead of IVL. Thank you very much. Uh, there is also lots of interest in the use of intravascular lithotripsy in left main uh, lesions. I think this is a call for you, Michael. You showed an excellent case. Is there any different kind of application of protocol we should use with IVL in left main as compared to other lesions? 
Yeah, I think, Emanuele, the, the major point here is how well the patient is going to tolerate the temporary occlusion of the left main. That is why I showed you in this particular case, uh, we had 17 seconds of occlusion. So most patients can tolerate this. In our particular patient, we had significant triple vessel disease with this uh, additional occluded right coronary artery in a very comi bite patient. So here, therefore, we intended to go for a hemodynamic support with the impeller that gives you then the full liberty to uh, occlude the left main as long as you really need it with your IVL balloon. So in general, we try to, to do the full range of 10 pulses per cycle. Um, if that is not possible because the patient is going to deteriorate hemodynamically, actually we shorten that. And if you foresee that is going to happen, take the hemodynamic support. That is great indeed. Uh, just one uh, short question again to you, Michael. What is actually the advantage of using IVL in left main stenosis really as compared to atherectomy uh, technologies? Is there any pros, contra, contra? Yeah, I think for me, at least there are three major reasons which are in pro of the IVL. First of all, I can modify both superficial and deep calcification. Second, in particular, in the setting of the left main, it allows me to have additional wires on board in order to protect my side branches. This is something with rotational atherectomy, for example, which is not possible. And then finally, at least in my personal experience, the risk that you encounter a no reflow scenario is significantly less with the IVL in comparison to the rotablator. And consider, please, if you have no reflow in a left main stenosis, this can really deteriorate the patient's significantly. Fair enough. And now the cherry on the cake. Your case, Flavio, it, it actually uh, raised enormous enthusiasm. This use of uh, intravascular lithotripsy in peripheral vascular disease, is there a difference in the protocol? How many pulses would you deliver in PVD as compared to the coronary arteries? Well, uh, thank you, Emanuele. No, I, I think that we are learning how to use the device. Uh, you know, we are cardiologists. We do perform peripheral interventions in our center. But the experience with the IVL in peripheral vessels is limited in, in our hospital. What we take is what we have seen from the registries and the dedicated studies. And as we said for the coronaries, we look at the opening of the balloon. When you see that the balloon is well opened, you can assume that the, the IVL has done its job. In the first uh, attempt, you see that the introducer didn't cross. You know that the e sheet from Edwards is an excellent introducer, very gliding, but it didn't go because there was a lot of calcium. After the second cycle, it went easily. Well, I know that you're an experienced operator, not just in coronary interventions, but also in peripheral interventions. What is, according to you, the advantage of using IVL as compared to a regular PTA, for example? Why not PTA and someone should think to IVL? I think we might extrapolate the results of the PEPCAT study peripheral, where you see that compared to plain old balloons, you have uh, more benign dissections, less dissections. But the most uh, comfortable data is that we have never seen perforations with IVL. It's very, very extremely infrequent in the coronaries, and it has not been seen in the peripheral. And you know that vascular perforation with high balloon pressures in the iliac, it's a dreadful complication. So you feel much more comfortable. You open your vessel, you can put your introducer, and you don't have this, let's say, back thought of, God, what might happen if the iliac breaks? Not only, you also prevent to implanting a stent over there, and then you are forced to cross the stent with the e-sheath or any other uh, uh, delivery system. So that is also an uh, adjunctive benefit, I guess. There is one colleague who is uh, curious to understand why did you perform TAVI first and then PCI? Wouldn't have been easier to do PCI first, also considering possible challenge to position your guiding catheter in the coronary artery? What is your guess on that? Well, you know, I don't like iffy jobs. That, that's a <laughs> short <laughs> question. No, no. But there is a very clear physiologic explanation for that. And, and, and like what Arif showed three, the corner is before, uh, it's a rule in my center that we always treat the, the valve before because anything that might happen on the coronaries when you have complex calcified lesions will be better tolerated once you have get rid of the LV obstruction. 
So uh, we are never, let's say, worried about the possibility of the coronary access. This is either for the balloon expandables or for the self-expandable valves. We get rid of the aortic stenosis and then we consider the, the coronary lesion. In this case, we treated the lesion during the same procedure because the patient had actually an acute coronary syndrome that might be or could be a good indication to treat the coronary first. But Flavio. in 99% of cases, the coronary lesion is found just by chance. And this is why we Flavio. left it. Thank you. Actually, these are great arguments. There are colleagues asking, what, what is the risk of complications there? What are the data supporting all this? I think it's high time now to listen to the two clinical lectures that will focus on this aspect. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, really a great pleasure to be here and to have the opportunity to share our real-world data about the European usage of intravascular lithotripsy. So data coming from studies designed for regulatory approval of coronary intravascular lithotripsy demonstrated the safety and efficacy of this device when dealing with calcified de novo lesions. Although the Bistrup CAT 2 and 3 results are now published, data from the real-world usage of EBL are still limited. So our study uh, was an investigator's own and directed retrospective singular multicenter UK and Italian registry to assess the efficacy and safety of EBL treatment for evilly calcified coronary lesions. Main endpoints of our uh, analysis were procedural success, defined as complete balloon stent expansion with residual diameter stenosis less than 30% and final tree flow, and MACE, defined as a composite of cardiac death, target vessel MI, and ischemia-driven uh, TLR. So between November 2018 and February 2020, 190 patients with 200 heavily calcified lesions were retrospectively identified and added into a dedicated data database. Looking at the baseline clinical characteristics, uh, we can see that our uh, population um, uh, was re uh, represented by 50% uh, of diabetic patients, a higher rate compared to the district CAD studies. 53% of the patients uh, underwent prior uh, PCI and 48% of the patients uh, treated uh, were admitted because of acute coronary syndrome. And even these characteristics was completely different compared to the district CAD studies. Looking at the lesion and procedural characteristics, we can see that 23% uh, of the lesions that treated were instant uh, risk stenosis or neoatherosclerotic lesions. 15% of the patients treated had a lesion on the left main, and also these characteristics was different compared to the district CAD studies. And uh, most important, 74% of the lesions uh, treated were undilatable lesions requiring uh, EVL, and 17% uh, required a combined approach of rotational atherectomy uh, followed by uh, intravascular uh, lithotripsy. Uh, intravascular imaging guide was performed in only 23% uh, of uh, our uh, procedures. Uh, the uh, EBL balloon size most commonly used was a 3 uh, per 12 uh, millimeter, and the mean diameter of the EBL balloon was 3.3 plus minus 0 0.5. Of interest, no more than one EBL balloon was used per patient. Ten patients had more than one lesion treated with EBL, but with the same EBL balloon. No cases where we needed two different size balloons in each case were reported. So this is a case example of a patient uh, enrolled in our registry. Uh, she is a 67-year-old uh, uh, female with chronic kidney disease. She underwent prior surgical uh, and percutaneous uh, revascularization, and the lady has a, a severe um, left ventricle dysfunction with an EF of 27%. She was admitted to our unit because of chest pain and and effort uh, dyspnea, and uh, after coronary uh, angiogram, uh, we uh, showed a functionally uh, occluded, occluded left internal mammary artery, 
a complete occlusion of the uh, SPG uh, to the ramus, uh, a patent SBG to the PDA, uh, and uh, a, um, a severe uh, stenosis on the osteal uh, proximal uh, left circle. Uh, this was the target of our procedure. We decided to use uh, a hemodynamic support with Impella uh, CP. Uh, as you can see, uh, different uh, NC balloons were inflated uh, at the uh, osteal left circle, um, and a suboptimal expansion uh, of both balloons uh, was uh, shown, uh, even if a very high atmospheres were uh, adopted. So. <clears throat> We decided to uh, try to dilate the lesion, the undilatable lesion at the ostal left circ uh, using an EDL balloon 312 uh, uh, inflated at four to six atmospheres, eight cycles of 10 pulses. And as you can see, the lesion was uh, fully uh, expanded. Uh, following this uh, EVL inflation, uh, uh, another predilatation with a fully expanded NC balloon was performed and a 3, 5, 15 millimeter uh, drag eluting stent was implanted from the left main toward the left circle. And this was the final result following uh, post dilatation with a 4 O balloon at high atmospheres. Procedural success was 99%. At a median follow-up time of 222 uh, days, definite probable stent thrombosis rate was 0.5%, cardiac death rate 1%, target vessel MI rate 0.5%, the DTLR rate per lesion 1.5%, and MACE rate was 2.6%. If we compare our results versus the disrupt cut trials, we uh, can appreciate similar uh, outcomes and the differences in terms of MI and MACE rate were mostly related to a different uh, MI definition adopted among the three um, different uh, studies. So, uh, based on our experience, we proposed a, a practical algorithm on how to use uh, EVL during the um, uh, everyday interventional practice when we face with calcified lesion. In case the microcatheter or a very small in diameter balloon or the ibus probe cannot pass the lesion, so this would be uh, a good indication uh, for rotational or, or orbital atherectomy or eczema riser, while on the other end, uh, stepwise uh, inflation uh, with different um, uh, NC uh, balloon size or scoring or cutting balloon uh, should be uh, attempted uh, in order to dilate the lesion. And in case of suboptimal lesion expansion, uh, then uh, intravascular lithotripsy uh, could be uh, a very good option to manage our resistant and easily calcified lesion. So in conclusion, our data from a real-world population with calcified lesions treated by EVL showed uh, safety and efficacy of EVL in the treatment of complex coronary uh, lesions, most of them undilatable with standard devices. The event rate uh, reported was low at mid-term follow-up. The role of a combined EVL plus other preparing devices such as rotational atherectomy needs to be uh, investigated as well as long-term follow-up after EVL for the treatment of easily calcified coronary lesions. Thank you for your attention. Hi, I'm Margaret McIntyre from the Golden Jubilee Hospital in Glasgow, and I'm going to present to you a cost resource analysis using IVL. So, Corny IVL became available in the UK in 2018, but shortly after its availability access, the technology was quickly rationed or withdrawn in some centres due to the device incremental cost. So we decided to perform a comparison of procedural resource utilisation between an initial cohort of patients we treated with IVL and compare them to patients we treated with rotational atherectomy. So we looked at a prospective cohort of cases treated with IVL and we compared them to a retrospective cohort of patients treated with rotational atherectomy. 
We're able to obtain demographic and procedural data from an electronic database we use for all our cases. And we're able to, to obtain consumable utilisation data from an electronic inventory management system that we routinely use in our cath lab. So in this initial analysis, we were able to see really that the only difference we could see in terms of uh, consumables was that we used less guide wires in the IVL cases and numerically less balloons. There was no real dramatic initial difference uh, in the resource utilisation. When we looked specifically at guide extensions, we were able to see that we're using guide extensions in almost a third of patients with rotational arthrectomy, but only one in eight patients who were having IVL. So on our initial look at cost, it looked like the IVL procedures were more expensive, though not quite significantly than the rotablation cases. But if you look closely, you'll see there's a big outlier, very expensive case here in the IVL group, which was an extremely complicated case. It had multiple uh, atherectomy devices, IVLs, and other calcium modification devices used in that case. Furthermore, when we looked into the IVL cases in the bigger group, there was a further four cases that had rotashock, so rotablation and IVL used in the same case. So if we separated these out, in fact, what we saw was there was no cost differential between the IVL cases and the rotablation cases, and the rotashock cases were more expensive than when you used each of the devices alone. So obviously the limitation of this initial analysis was it was a small sample size, it was our initial experience with this new technology. We didn't take it into consideration the complexity of the disease that was being treated. We're comparing a retrospective to a prospective cohort. We felt that we needed to go on and perform some further analysis to confirm what we'd found. So we were able to obtain cost data from the Disrupt CAD 2 study and decided therefore to go on and compare that patient cohort with our rotational patient cohort and the cost of those procedures. So from the SHRUPCAD 2, we had 120 case, cases treated with IVL. And what we did was we retrospectively went back and looked at our rotablation cases and three of the interventional cardiologists who performed rotational atherectomy and IVL adjudicated 60 cases that we thought were suitable for both technologies. All these lesions were single de novo calcified lesions. So we went on to compare equipment utilisation. We were able to see that in Disrupt CAD 3, they used significantly less balloons, guide wires, guide catheters, guide extensions, and drug looting stents than we had used in these 60 retrospective rotational atherectomy cases. And if we look at cost, you'll see the IVL cases were significantly less expensive than the rotablation cases. When we look at procedure duration, the IVL procedures were, were quicker, but with slightly more fluoroscopy, most likely due to um, the early use of the device and people wanting to assess bone expansion during the delivery of therapy. So again, the limitation of this analysis was that we didn't take into consideration the disease complexity. Very importantly, this was a comparison between a retrospective real-world cohort of rotablation cases comparing them to a prospective clinical trial population of IVL cases. So we'd expect the disease complexity to be less in the clinical trial patients. So again, we felt this was reassuring about the cost, but we would like to go on and do a little bit further analysis in the real world to confirm what we'd found. So what we next did more recently was that we went on to compare the prospect of a real, the prospect of cohort of real world IVL cases to the analysis that we've already performed. So what you see here is the two on the left hand side. You see that initial analysis of the ninety seven rotablation cases, comparing them to our first twenty six IVL cases. You then see the comparison we did with our rotablation cases to the Disrupt CAD two cases, and then on the far right. You see the subsequent 60 cases we treated with IVL in our centres. So these were real-world IVL cases, all comers. And what you can see there is, again, the cost is uh, favourable and is consistent with what we found in the, in the previous two analysis I've presented. Interestingly, and I think usefully in terms of trying in terms of resource utilisation in our, our everyday clinical practice, we decided that we would look at the cost of combination therapy. So when you use IVL, but you've used other devices, and what you can quite clearly see here is as you add a device on and another device on, the procedure starts to become very expensive. 
So in conclusion, IVL is cost effective in comparison to rotational atherectomy. The higher incremental device cost is offset by using fewer guide wires, balloons, guide extensions and druglet and stents. The shorter procedure duration may also result in additional cost savings. Combination therapy is expensive and I think this suggests that if we select the right device up front, this could be cost saving in our practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both Alfonso and Margaret. I, I invite you to uh, unmute your microphone and join the discussion. Again, uh, congratulations to Olga. He did a great job in uh, facilitating the, the chat. We have got a lot of questions for both of you. Let me start with Alfonso. Despite you included in your series very high-risk patients, high-risk profile and challenging anatomies, your data nicely compare with the prospective disrupt cut series uh, uh, trial data. The colleagues are interested in complication, in risks. Can you share your experience? Do you have any insight in your data on IVL-related complications? Thank you for your question, Emanuele. Uh, in our registry, we have no complications such as arrhythmias, balloon entrapment, or neuroclore phenomenon due to EBL balloon rupture, which was described up to 99% in other series. On the other end, we reported six cases of coronary perforation. One was type 1 on Alice classification, three were type 2, and the remaining two were type 3. None of the perforations were directly related to the EVL use immediately uh, after EVL inflation, but occurred either after stent deployment or during the stent post dilatation phase. All the type 3 and one of the type 2 perforations needed covered stents, whereas the rest of perforations settled with the prolonged balloon inflation at low pressure. The perforation rate we reported is higher compared to the disrupt cut studies, where 0.3% uh, um, uh, uh, was uh, reported uh, in the disrupt cut 3 study. Uh, and probably uh, our rate was related to the highly resistant lesions we uh, approached. From my personal experience, I would suggest to avoid aggressive dilatation in terms of the, uh, stent, uh, the balloon stent and or MC balloon after a successful EVL vessel dilatation, particularly when we are approaching resistant lesions. Thank you, Alfonso. Uh, Margaret, uh, one of the comments from the colleagues was about uh, uh, the following. He doesn't have OCT, I was in his cat lab. Uh, so uh, how can he decide whether to use right away IVL just based on the angiogram? And we know how expensive it became this uh, technology when you combine different tools and techniques. So how to optimize cost and how do post directly indication based on the angiogram? What is your algorithm? Okay, so if you don't have access to intravascular imaging, I think the first thing you need to do is assess the severity of calcium on the angiogram. So we know it's less sensitive than intravascular imaging, but it will give you some information. So if you see severe angiographic calcium, so calcium on both sides of the vessel, when the, the, when the vessel is not in cardiac motion, that will affect your stent expansion. So you're really thinking you're going to need to use a a calcium modification device in that situation. So severe angiographic calcium, both sides of the vessel, I would suggest IVL is a good initial strategy in that situation. I think if you see what looks like angiographically nodular calcium, that's a slightly different scenario. And maybe that might be a situation in which if you have to choose one device, you would maybe choose atherectomy. Another useful technique is to do a balloon palpation. So you take a one-to-one -one non-compliant balloon as you can size it on your angiogram as best you can and you inflate that balloon and you check expansion on two contralateral views to ensure that you're seeing adequate balloon expansion. And that might give you confidence to go on without further calcium modification. But that would be my advice if you don't have access to imaging. Obviously, if you have imaging, that's going to be your gold standard. Great. Thank you very much. Very clear points. Now back to Alfonso. Short uh, question. I hope short answer. Any issue to use IVL balloon in ACS patients? Um, no, uh, in my opinion, I have no uh, particular concerns about the use of this kind of device in ACS patients because, of course, we are talking about resistant lesions. So even if some thrombus could be uh, seen at the level uh, of the lesion, uh, once we uh, predilate with a um, NC uh, balloon uh, seeing a suboptimal expansion of the lesion, I have no uh, major problems to approach uh, a calcified lesions with EDL, even in ACS patients. 
Thank you very much. And now uh, two last remaining points for Margaret. So uh, one of the colleagues is interested in knowing the uh, adoption of IVL in SVGs, Safinus vein grafts. I know that you have some experience there. And second and last point for you is about the learning curve. Is there a learning curve that we need to uh, anticipate in using properly IVL, IVL in itself as a technology and to select the right lesion? What is your guess on that? So we'll start with the learning curve. So the use of the device has no learning curve. As soon as somebody teaches you how to plug it into the, the console, um, then it's incredibly straightforward. It's essentially just balloon dilatation with activation of therapy by pressing the button on the, the handle of the device. So once someone's shown you to use it once, it's very user-friendly. And I think that's one of the major advantages of the device because it means that people who are not comfortable with atherectomy are able to use it in the middle of the night on the weekend dealing with STEMIs and STEMIs, whatever the case is. Thank you very much. I think it is uh, now time to wrap up this session. I want to thank again Holger for the excellent job done in the chat, the three operators that had joined us in the first part of the session, and of course, Alfonso and Margaret. Let me just summarize the key points we learned today. First, IVL is uh, only the sky's limit. Basically, they showed us, the colleagues, that we can use IVL in peripheral vascular disease, in aortic stenosis patients, patients with reduced LV function, left main disease. Secondly, we learned from the series of Alfonso that it is a safe technology. There's not much complications going on. And third, uh, but also important, the learning curve is extremely short and it can become cost effective, this device, if you use it properly and if you select properly the lesion setting where to adopt this. There were many other questions in the chat that we couldn't address, more specifically related to uh, the indication to PCI in the context of aortic stenosis and in bifurcation lesions. I uh, invite you to join dedicated session at EuroPCR on these topics. Thank you very much for being with us.